today, um, what I want to continue to talk about uh, is the fulfillment of the promises of God about um, the birth of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Deliverer, uh, our King, the King of glory, the King of the universe, the creator of the universe, Lord Jesus Christ, the one we serve, who we adore, who we worship, as we sang this morning, as Koba led us in that wonderful worship. Didn't we have time worshiping God? Wasn't it wonderful this morning uh, to worship the Lord Jesus uh, and give him his due here at church? Um, today, what I'd like to talk about is uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy, particularly of Isaiah the prophet, an 8th century prophet, um, that is that he prophesied uh, over 800 years before the birth of Jesus um, about his birth and about his character and about what God sent him to do. And um, what we'd like to do is look at the prophecy of uh, Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 7. If you turn with me to, uh, or just look at uh, chapter 7 uh, of the book of Isaiah so that we could read uh, that prophecy in verse 13 and following will read right there that Isaiah the prophet was given a revelation from God. Everybody say revelation. revelation. A revelation from God. A revelation means the opening, the opening of, uh, of a truth that's been a mystery. That's been a mystery but is no longer a mystery. And that's a revelation. It's like some people call an aha moment. Has anybody ever had an aha moment? When you've been working through a problem, you can't solve the problem, you step away from the problem for a while, and you come back and you have the answer to the problem. You go, aha, I get it now. And most of us have had those kinds of revelations. Well, here is one of the, the if not the greatest, aha moment in all of history, where finally... The purposes of God are revealed, are made clear uh, through the prophets regarding God's purpose for uh, human history, regarding God's purpose for your life, regarding God's purpose for my life. You see, God has a purpose for everything that happens. There is a purpose behind it. Everything that happens, there is a purpose. Do you believe that everything that happens has a purpose to it? Right. God has a purpose for everything. Nothing happens uh, by chance, as people would like to think. Uh, things happen because God has a purpose for it. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, God has a purpose for the things that happen in your life and in my life. And so here we read about the great purpose of God uh, in the book of Isaiah with regard to uh, God's taking care of the biggest problem of all uh, human nature. The biggest and the deepest problem of all human nature is that all of us have been affected by the sin of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And as a result of that, our nature, our human nature is tainted by what some great thinkers throughout history, like St. Augustine and others, by what we call original sin. And that is that we, we as human beings share in the sin nature of our fallen uh, father Adam and in the sin nature of Eve his wife when they disobeyed God in the garden even before uh, we grow up to come to a consciousness of sin as adults that sin nature I would venture to say in my opinion is part of our biology is part of our spirituality that we're sinners by birth does everybody know what we're talking about here that although it's not expressed until we're of the age of conscience uh, that that sin runs in our warp and woof as human beings. I would venture to say, in, in my opinion, that's very much a part, maybe, of our human genome, of our, of our DNA, of our nature, something that we can't get rid of, something that we would like to get rid of, but we can't, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, no matter um, uh, uh, how much we search. We, we can't take care of that problem by ourselves. The better we want to be, the worse we are. Uh, the harder we try, the worse we get. 
And um, you don't even have to be a Christian or a Jew or a religious person to understand that we're born with a conscience that allows us through the natural law of God to understand that we're not the people that we would like to be, no matter how we try. Has that been everybody's experience in here so far? Yeah. Then we're all in the same boat. To, to, to try to hide it, we can do that with drugs, we could do that with alcohol, we could do that with all kinds of escapism, we can hide, hide from the fact that we don't want to realize that we're not the people we want to be, but uh, like, uh, who was it, Michael Jackson that says when you look at the man in the mirror, and then we're really, or let's say the woman in the mirror, let's be equal, and when we look in the mirror, we realize uh, that we're not the people that we would like to be, no matter how hard we try. Well, good news, um, good news. The prophets throughout the history of the Bible let us know that God understood the problem that separated from, uh, humanity from God. God understands that sin separates us from him. And God doesn't want to be separated from you. God doesn't want to be separated from me. God wants you and I to have the same fellowship that he had with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they disobeyed God. God wants to have fellowship with you. God wants to have fellowship with me. And to do that, God has to eliminate that which stands between you and God and me and God that doesn't allow for us to have that fellowship together that we once had. You see, because the problem that separates you and me from God is the problem of sin. The problem of sin. The sin in our nature. The sin that God condemns through his law of conscience or through his law in scripture. The sin that God hates because it separates you and me from him. And God from eternity did not make you and me to be separated from him. From eternity, God made you for him and, and he exists for us. In fact, we learned last week about the word Emmanuel that means God is with us us and so what does God want to do he wants to eliminate the sin problem so God has a plan from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible God has a plan to remove what stands between you and God isn't that wonderful isn't that wonderful isn't that wonderful and so his plan was revealed through his prophets through his prophets. And so his people, Israel, were looking forward to seeing the signs that God was about to bring into history the solution for the deepest and biggest problem of all. God was about to do away with sin. For what purpose? So that you and God can be reconciled to one another and so that by the work of God and his grace that reconciliation between you and God after the removal of sin would bring peace between you and God and the cessation of conflict between your nature and his nature and so that God would then restore that fellowship with you that he wants to have so bad. Well, let's find out how that happened. Because the story is exciting. Because the story is the story of Christmas. The story is the story of what God did in order to remove the obstacle between you and God and me and God. That which causes war and strife and grief and pain and depression and hatred and bitterness and anger. God's about to remove that problem from the face of the earth and it starts with someone very special that Christmas is all about. Isaiah 7.13 says, Then he said, Hear now, O house of David. Why do you think he would say, Hear now, O house of David? Because he promised, God promised that to the house of David he would bring this eternal Savior that would remove that problem. And he promised him that out of his DNA would come a king of the universe that would rule forever. 
God promised David that. Oh, but this, to some people in Israel, the promise took too long. The promise was given to Adam. When God kicked Adam out of the garden, God said to Adam, he said, there's going to come a time where there'll be one human being that will appear in the history of all human nature. And he will, will crush the head of the one that deceived you in the garden. But the one in the garden, he will bite his heel. The deceiving serpent would bite the heel of that one that would eliminate the problem. But the promise was that the one that will eliminate the problem of sin and failure before God would crush the devil's head. Is everybody listening? That's the beginning of the prophetic revelation. That, that, that this person, who do you think this person that God would send that would crush the devil's head? Jesus. Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. He would crush Satan's head. He would crush the one that makes you and me fail before God. He would crush the one that would make me and you sin before God. He would crush his head. Why do you think a snake's head needs to be crushed? Oh, because you could cut the snake's body and you could cut his neck off. But if you come a week later where you cut that snake in half, that head would still be yapping at you. In other words, in order to eliminate a poisonous snake, what needs to be done? You need to crush his head, smash the snake's head with a stone. And Jesus smashed Satan's head at the cross of Calvary. Jesus crushed our eternal enemy, and he is no longer a victor. Jesus is a conqueror over sin at the cross of Calvary. But guess what? The prophet is going to tell us that this is going to happen. He makes it clear. He says, now he said, now house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, the virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I want you to turn with me now again uh, to the book of St. Luke. If you would turn to me to St. Luke. Are you there? St. Luke chapter 2. Are you there? And watch this in verse 8. This is part of the Christmas story. Do you want to hear a little bit about the Christmas story? Or watch this. Now there were in the same, and, and this is verse, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a what? A sign. Have we heard that word again in Isaiah? Yeah. We heard that word. In Isaiah, we heard this word. And this will be a sign. A virgin shall conceive a son. Is everybody listening? A virgin will conceive a son. Now that's a miracle right there, right? That a young woman who had never been with a guy that wasn't pregnant from a guy got pregnant from God. That was a, a, a fantastic, phenomenal miracle. That she would conceive a baby in her womb without lying with a man. That was a sign. Does everybody say sign? The virgin will conceive, a, a, a virgin, the virgin, will conceive a, 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 a baby. That will be a what? A sign. Somebody say a sign. And here, right here, it says this too. It says, uh, right here. And this will be a what? A sign. Everybody say sign. sign. To you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. All right. Now, I'd like to focus on this word that both the prophet Isaiah uses and the St. Luke uses to describe this marvelous occasion that we call Christmas. 
And the word that I'd like to focus on, the operative word, is a sign. Everybody say a sign. And this will be a what? A sign. One more time. This will be a what? A sign. Now, there's all kinds of signs in there. Some people talk about the signs of the times. Okay, and we look around at, at the news, and, and, and my, my grandson came up to me the other day, and he's a perceptive little guy, and he's just walking through the, through the room because I'm looking at the news. I like to look at the news. I like to stay in touch with what's going on. I think a pastor is a, a watchman standing on the tower looking at the horizon of history and time to see where, what's happening out there and to preach about that to his people. And so when we look around and we look at the signs of the times, we know that it won't be long before something gives. It won't be long before something gives. And let me tell you what, we're not going to blow ourselves up with atom bombs. No, get that thought out of your head. The world's not going to fall apart because we're going to go into a war that's going to be atom bombs. No, the Bible says that the world is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God's in charge of this world. Is everybody listening to me? God's in charge of this world. And God will not be done with this world until the last person that needs to hear about Jesus hears about Jesus, even if it is in the, in the mountains of outer Mongolia. That person has to hear about Jesus before the, the time of the time's end, before Jesus comes back again. But we're looking around, we see that something's going on, isn't it? Let me tell you what's going on. God's at work. Let me tell you what's happening. God's at work. You look around you and you see, uh, you see catastrophes. We see fires burning in the north of California. We see fires burning right here in Westlake Village. We see hurricanes, tornadoes. We see drought. Um, we see climactic changes. Uh, look around us and we see all kinds of different things happening. But we know one thing, people. It, it's not out of control because God's in control. No matter how much fear you have, it just says right here that the angels came to the shepherds and said, fear not. Is everybody listening? What did the angels say? Fear, fear not. So is fear something that Christians should walk around with? We shouldn't fear the president. We shouldn't fear the Congress. We shouldn't fear anything because Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with you. God is with me. Okay, so we talk about the signs of the times, right, church? Well, there's other kinds of signs, too. You ever be right, driving along the road somewhere and you start seeing signs on the freeway? I may have looked around and you see, oh, oh, can, can, can you think of different signs that we see on the freeway? What well, signs say San Francisco, 383 miles, right? And then you get to Fresno and say San Francisco, 85 miles. Then you get to Bodesto in San Francisco, 75 miles. You get to San Jose, San Francisco, 49 miles. Right? And, and, and you're looking forward to getting where? San, you're driving to San Francisco, right? And there's signs all along the road to San Francisco, right? And then you, you come to the last one. You come to the last sign before you have to take the 80. But you and your wife are talking. And it's getting really good. And she's putting peanuts in your mouth, which you love when you have your honey with you. And you know, how many, how many brothers love when you're driving along and, and your wife starts feeding you corn nuts and peanuts and honey, do you want a little bit of this? And you want a bit of little of that? And, and you guys haven't been talking for the last week and, and, and you're starting a little reconciliation on the road and exchanging pleasantries and, and all that kind of stuff. And you're talking really good. And all of a sudden, guess what? You're in Eureka. You're 150 miles away from San Francisco. What? We got the reservation in San Francisco. We're going to see the Golden Gate Bridge. And all of a sudden you go, hey, don't give me those peanuts. You made me miss the sign. Because <laughs> it's your fault because you're getting on lovey-dovey. Get back in your seatbelt. Hey, what happened, church? We miss what? You missed the sign. You got distracted. You missed a sign. We should have been looking. We weren't looking. We weren't paying attention. Is everybody listening to what I'm talking about? Because we missed what? We missed a sign. Now that, we got to take that one now. Right? 
But there's no detours around God. There's no detours around heaven. There's only one sign that we're going to get that we're on the right track. There's only one sign that we're going to get that we chose the right way. There's only one sign that we're going to, that we're going to get that we're on the right track to the destination. And the only sign we're going to get to take us out of our misery that the devil brings into our life is a sign that the virgin conceived a son and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is the only sign that we need to read, that we need to get. Get off on Jesus. Right? Don't turn before. Don't turn after. There's all kinds of signs. Somebody here that hasn't been in church for a while. I'm so glad that you're here. Why? Because it's a sign that you're on the right track. It's a sign that you came to where you belong. It's a sign that you're reaching your destination. Oh, let me tell you what, you're not, you're not there yet. I'm not there yet. But it's a sign that you're on the right track. It's a sign that God's at work. It's a sign that Emmanuel's there. As long as Emmanuel's there, Emmanuel's going to take you to the right destination, which means until you come and you repent and I repent before Jesus and kneel down next to the manger like the wise men did, like the shepherds did, the sign was for the salvation of mankind. What is the sign that the virgin would conceive? Rather, who is the sign? Jesus. That's the main sign. That's the sign of our life. That's the sign of your life. You don't want to miss that sign. Too many people have missed the sign. And, and where are their lives at? On a dead end. In an alley. On a dead end. On Sunday morning. Disgusted. Hung over. Angry at your ex. Planning court. Planning mayhem. Angry because our selfish life has been interrupted by responsibility. You don't want to follow the sign that says sin. Sin 25 miles away. Sin city. We don't want to follow that sign. And then when God brings people to know him, there's another heavy sign. A sign that God's at work. A sign that Jesus is at work in your heart and mine. It's when the tears start coming out of a man's eyes. It's when a man bows down. It's when a man says, I surrender to you, God. I give you my pride. I give you my hate. I give you my arrogance. I give you my visceral response to my wife. I give you my selfishness. And when a lady says, I give you my greediness. I give you my bitterness. And those tears start coming down from the eyes. Now that's a true sign that you're on the way to Jesus. That's a sign that God's at work. No, ladies, don't mistake the tears of your husband who's coming to God as signs of weakness. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of a man becoming a real man. Right. Don't say, I wish it was like it was before. Don't ever say that. Don't say, what happened to the woman that I had? Don't say that. That's a sign that the devil is still at work in our hearts. We don't want to go back to where we were. We want to reach our destination. And so when we say that the prophet, it says here in, in the scriptures, it says that so that the prophet's word might be fulfilled. And what is that fulfillment we're talking about? When is the fulfillment? Does that mean that everything was fulfilled when Jesus was born? No. It meant that it was a sign that fulfillment had just begun. What kind of fulfillment? That this was the king of glory, that he would grow up, that his mama would teach him the Ten Commandments, that his mama would teach him to worship God, that his mama would teach him the law of God, how to live in purity, that he would live a life in a body, in a body, because it says that God prepared for him a body, the body of a lamb from the foundations of the world that was untouched by human sin. Listen, listen to me for a minute. Follow me for a minute. 
How many of us can live a whole day without thinking a sinful thought? None of us, right? Come on, you can wag your head. You're nobody going to hold nothing over you. None of us. We sin one way or another. I don't care how good you try to act. It's not about acting. It's about what God is doing in us. And the sign of the beginning of fulfillment of the prophet's prophecy, the revelation fulfilled was that the man we were waiting to remove the sins of the world had arrived. And the answer of God was here. And that we have reached our destination. And the destination was Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago to change the world and bring peace between you and God. Bring peace between one another. Bring peace between each other so we could say, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and thy neighbor as thyself. Can only happen when we have Jesus inside of our life. And he brings peace. The cessation of warfare and conflict between you and God can only come when the sin problem is done away with. When we say, Lord, I repent. Forgive me, Jesus. Lord, take my sins away. Amen. And God, and that's why they call him the Prince of Peace. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 9 where he says, his name shall be called Wonderful, Almighty God. Counselor, no, a, a wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father. That's Jesus. This is my granddaughter came up and said, Jesus is God. And no argument with that. He is the Everlasting Father. Isn't that wonderful? And in his name will be wonderful. Glorious. An angel spinning on a rock. Counselor, right? What does counselor mean? Lawyer. Anybody been in trouble and you had a good counselor? Anybody else? Three or four of us? And the rest of you criminals? I laugh at my wife is as close as Jesus as you ever want to get. And she's always defending people. So I'm saying, are you their counselor? He defends everybody. He goes, are you a lawyer? I always kid around with her like that. But guess what? We have the best counselor in town. Then we're going to say, Father, I died for her. She can come on right on in. All her sins have been washed away. She's been forgiven. Have you been forgiven? Has God cleaned you of your sins? Have your sins been washed away? <laughs>